start by talking a little bit about uh, what Ojo's mission is. Like, you know, I think some people know of the firm, but I think they don't always know of the product that you're producing. So what does Ojo do? Yeah, we, we get asked that a lot and that's okay. And we're okay with that. Um, yeah, Ojo, like, primarily we're a, a, a consumer product uh, for consumers, uh, an AI advisor. So people can get their real estate questions answered. Um, now, the way we work is we work through service professionals, real estate agents and, and mortgage brokers. So uh, at, a, <clears throat> at one level, we're able to take in uh, leads or consumers that are shopping for homes, uh, help them uh, establish what their preferences are, uh, learn through machine learning uh, what their likes and not, dislikes are, and then feed them back properties that are a great fit for, for what they're looking for, or, or help them to decide really what's important to them, because a lot of people, when they're starting out, they, they think they know what they want, and then it changes a lot. Uh, so through our process, they get real clear on, on the things they like. And then when they want to be connected with an agent, we're able to connect them with an agent to, to help them transact. And, and so how much of that is machine and then how much of that is people at Ojo doing all of that warming and getting everything clear? Yeah, that's a great question. It's, um, there's both. You know, we, we'd like to talk about our, our artificial and our human intelligence. So um, initially, a lot of times when, a, a lead, when we ingest a lead, let's say from an outside source, uh, uh, for example, we work with, uh, with Realogy and, and CobalBanker.com if someone comes in off that that source, <clears throat> we immediately contact them. We have a contact center on the island of St. Lucia. And <clears throat> we're able to talk to them and triage them, if you will, and, and find out, you know, do they want to be connected with an agent right then? Or is it better for them to be introduced to Ojo so that they can, over time, um, you know, keep going down the path on the, um, the process that they're on? We have a, uh, when they're communicating with Ojo via SMS, a lot of that is machine. Sometimes it's human. You know, if they ask the machine a question it doesn't know, that fires a, a trigger off to a human, one of our, what we call our AI trainers, who are then able to uh, find the answer to the question and then respond. Uh, we also have a concierge team, which are humans. And, you know, once we've connected an agent and a consumer, we're then able to, um, that concierge is able to help facilitate the communication between both parties, make sure that everyone's having a great experience and marching down the path to buying or selling their home. And one of the things I remember just in visiting you guys <clears throat> and, and talking with the team about how it works is that that is seamless. I mean, the time between the transition from machine to person trainer or person concierge is, is really, it's fast, right? I mean, that's yeah. part of what makes AI work. Yeah, it, it, um, it's, it's part of having a really great experience. You know, when, as, as consumers, when we want something, we want it now. And right. um, the other thing that, that we know as, as consumers, it's, it's really frustrating if you want to talk to a human and you can't, or you don't want to talk to a human, but you're, you're forced to. So we're very conscious of that and make sure that we're communicating with people the way that, that they want to be communicated with. In thinking about Ojo's work, how do you feel like the COVID experience or the way that real estate is changing as a result of shelter in place has been impacted? Like what, what are the machines learning from that experience? Um, well, as a company, it's worked out really well for us on, on a lot of fronts. Uh, number one, we discovered that our, that our team is super effective working remotely and working from home. Yeah. Uh, from a consumer perspective, what we've seen is consumer preferences have really shifted during this. And, and it makes sense. You know, with people spending more time in their home than they've ever spent before, uh, you know, people start to get really clear on what they like and don't like about their home when they're there 24 seven. So we have people starting to focus more now on their searches. Uh, well, two things happened. Number one, we saw more people go online. Which again makes sense because people had the sure. time to do that. <laughs> Not a lot of options at that point, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and then we started to see a shift in their preferences. So people starting to um, to focus more on outdoor spaces, you know, the, a yard, a patio. Uh, people starting to um, look at properties with with an extra room, um, which we can all relate to, especially if you have. Yeah. 
to young kids. A French know, bulldog or children, <laughs> right. Um, where, you know, they go, wow, I need to have an office, right? I need, we need an extra room. This, this is really challenging uh, if I'm going to continue to work this way for, you know, whatever period of time. So those are the type of, of changes we see. I think, I think on a macro level, we'll start to see, um, we'll start to see a shift in where people are living. Uh, there's, there's, there's no doubt in my mind that will happen. How, how big of a shift, um, time will tell. Uh, but you know, people who are working for companies that may not return to an office or people that are working for companies where they now have the ability to you know, work from wherever they want indefinitely will probably you know, look at, okay, do I need to live where I'm living anymore? Or can I live somewhere else or you know, go back home or you know, wherever it is that they rather be or someplace that's more affordable so they can buy a home instead of running a home. Yeah, I think, I think we definitely are anticipating that in our market. And I think that's appropriate at a national level. The question will be, you know, how pensive are they around that today, given the fact that employers are still sort of working through the machinations of what it looks like in the future to be in an office or not be in the office. And um, yeah. I know, I know all of us are thinking about how much of this staff is going to stay home forever and which ones are not? And what does that mean? And how do you yeah. handle that equitably? All that, all that stuff. So uh, you guys have a beautiful new office. How many people are in it today? We are uh, about a hundred and about 120. Uh, and that, uh, but today there's probably zero. Yeah. Uh, most but, of them are home still. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but we have about a hundred and I think about 120, 125 here in Austin. Uh, yeah. And, I say here in Austin, I'm not in Austin today, but <laughs> normally I'm there. Um, so you, you mentioned your partnership with Realogy. That, I think that's definitely the thing that to some degree put Ojo on the map, certainly following the announcement related to Turnkey, which was the relationship between Realogy and Amazon. And as I understand it, Ojo was really the engine behind that product, but that product's been put on pause. What does that mean for you guys and the work that you were doing on that front? Um, you know, it doesn't... <laughs> It doesn't impact us that much. It was, um, we have a lot of stuff going on besides that. Uh, so that was one, one aspect of, of some of the things we're doing with Realogy. But, uh, you know, it's funny now that you mentioned it, I almost forgot about it, it was put on pause. So um, it's, it's hard to believe you forgot about Amazon, but, yeah. <laughs> but I believe you. <laughs> yeah. We actually have, we have, we have a lot of stuff going on, a lot of exciting things that are in yeah. the world, so. That's awesome. Um, tell us, so you, you made a presentation, I think during and then related to kind of what it might look like for the agent of the future as the agents continue to evolve their business practices related to the experiences we've just had. What do you, what, what were the top takeaways on that front? You know, um, you know, when we look at, I still have an agent team in San Diego, so I'm, I'm um, pretty still close. Still very much in touch. Yeah. Yeah. In touch. And as we talked about, I have a daughter who's an agent in Austin. So, <clears throat> As, as agents, there's certain things have happened over the last three or four months, right? We've all, I'll put on my agent's hat, we, we've all gotten accustomed to working remotely. We've all gotten accustomed to leveraging technology at a much higher level than we ever did before. And what's interesting about that is most of the technology that we're leveraging was there and has been there, um, right. but we just weren't using it. You know, we were maybe possibly stuck in our old ways or doing things the way we thought they needed to be done. I think people, uh, agents and consumers are now discovering that there, there may be better ways of doing what we've been doing. You know, you think about an, an agent who has, um, who has multiple appointments in a day, you know, and, and whether they're listing appointments or buyer consultations, you know, if they're driving and we'll use Austin, you know, if you're driving to, Round Rock and then to South Austin and then the East Austin. Yeah. How many can you really do with traffic and everything else? Where as if you're leveraging technology and, and zoom like we are right now, you, know, you could do three of those in three hours and, and accomplish more than you could. And, uh, you know, by possibly physically driving there. And from a consumer's perspective, like, there's a lot of consumers who I think would prefer this type of interaction than to have a bunch of agents coming to, you know, and, and interviewing them for the job of selling their house through, you know, these face-to-face um, -face, uh, things. So I think, I think agents will continue to leverage technology. I think consumers 
are getting used to it and, and some are saying, wow, this is, this is better. Like a lot of our consumers are, are employed. A lot of them are using Zoom all day long, getting very comfortable with it. So they'll be comfortable with it, you know, even after, afterwards. Yeah, uh, I think about it from a safety perspective too. I mean, I think over the weekend we saw a couple of really tragic announcements related to agent um, harm that occurred in the course of their business. And it, you know, it is a risky business. And I, we, we've all known that as an industry for a long time, we sort of skirt it because it felt like a necessary evil. But this kind of interaction gives the ability to go in depth with a client before you have to put yourself physically in the same space as them. And that makes a lot of sense from a safety perspective too. Yeah, it really does. Um, it's, uh, you know, to, to be able to see, I think it's also a um, meeting with a consumer is, is one of the ways that we differentiate ourselves as agents. And now mm -hmm. we're able to do that, you know, virtually and, and digitally. And that is a, a, a big advantage, you know, when that, when you're first coming in contact with that consumer. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, time will tell, but I tend to agree that the technology was there. We've been forced to use it. Now that we've been forced to use it, I think we found that it's not so scary and that it's going to continue to be a part of our lives. I think our jobs as an MLS and an association is to help make that seamless and integrate it in a way that the experience is fluid for both the agent and the client. So yeah. we'll, we've got our eye on that front. Um, let me turn a little bit to your work as a leader. So in, in looking at your social media and just kind of trying to get to know you virtually before we met here, uh, you're really into productivity, very into emotional intelligence and intuitive decision making. I am a, I know about myself, a fast intuitive decision maker, not as good as a, an emotional intelligence because I move quickly, but what do you feel like you've learned as a leader in this time period? <clears throat> That's a good question. You know, there's, it's, it's been a time where it's been um, probably easier than other times to really learn about ourselves because we're spending more time with ourselves than, than we ever have. Uh, I think the, um, I've, I've always valued from leadership, um, you know, the impact that we can make and, and the service that we can provide to those that we're leading when when it's being done virtually it, it almost uh, uh you almost have to amplify all the things you do to be able to have that same positive impact on the people that you work with so yeah. i think it's made me uh, I, I don't think i know it's made me better um i've had to uh be more purposeful about about checking in and and, and making sure i know how people are doing and, and if they're if they're struggling what they're struggling with and if they have needs you know how we meet those needs so it's i think it's just uh it's just put all those all those different characteristics on on a higher um you know higher alert if you will yeah i i definitely find that to be true i think you know in one way you have to be uber deliberate about to your point checking in with people you know it takes an effort to see them that's not the same as a desk drive by like it used to be um you don't have the same cues that you have when you're in the same when you're in a physical space together about how they're yeah. doing and then two there's an intimacy associated with working in the way that we are you know my staff has seen my home now which they would not normally you know have the opportunity to see and there are a lot of days that we're in workout wear, <laughs> establishing our goals and working through uh, major priorities. And I think that that has, has brought some walls down in some ways, uh, certainly from a hierarchical standpoint, we're all struggling with kids. We're all struggling with pets and working in the home. And I think it's, it's leveled the playing field a little bit, which is good. Yeah, I'm sitting on the floor in an Airbnb. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> no, but it does. It, it, um, I think... I think the other thing that's happened is people have gotten to know their team members and teammates at a deeper level than they ever had before. Yes, uh, and yes. So I, either because of the, the increase in communication or like you, some of the examples you just gave, Emily, that people are actually learning more about the people they work with than they have. Yeah, yeah. And I ultimately, I think that that uh, enhances trust, which enhances the 
to Stephen Covey's point, the speed at which we <laughs> move forward, right? Mm -hmm. There is something to that when it lasts that long. Uh, what, what's your hot take on the market overall? You know, let, let's close out just kind of having a, a future cast. What do you think we're moving towards? Things look good now. They're very hot. All the economists are saying we're in the check mark of the recovery, but the fall yep. looks a little scary still. So what are you thinking? Yeah, so um, I, I, we can never underestimate the impact of, of pent up demand, right? So <clears throat> every November and December in many parts of the country, we see things slow down. And then in January, and February, they pick right up. Um, and, and one of the reasons they, they go so fast at the beginning of the year is because you have that pent up demand from people who didn't do things, you know, during the holidays. When you have that type of, of halt or, or extreme slowdown, at the, at the busiest time of the year in the springtime. Um, and then that, those people start to return to the market. You really feel that. And that's what we're feeling right now. And I think we'll experience this, you know, at least through the end of summer. Beyond that, um, all bets are off. I mean, we don't, yeah. we, don't, we don't know if they're, you know, come next flu season, if we're all going to be back you know, really sheltering in space uh, in place again. And we also haven't seen, and, and we won't for several months, the true impact uh, of, on the economy of the uh, loss of jobs, of the businesses that had shut down temporarily or permanently, um, you know, that won't show up for a while. And it's also a, a little, a little foggy when you try to, to look at that impact because of the amount of um, intervention by the government with the stimulus. Yeah, we're highly stimulated right now, yeah. right. So, uh, you know, there's, here's what we know. We are about eight years into a, uh, into a cycle. And typically cycles don't go too much longer than that. So, you know, next year, the year after, uh, if we saw, you know, the economy go in the other direction, would that be a surprise? No. Um, but again, it's, there's, there's, it used to be much easier to have more clarity about uh, where things were going and where they're at. Now there's so many things that impact, impact that, that, that question that's really hard to see. I mean, who, a year ago, who would have been talking about a pandemic, you know, impacting the, the market? Yeah. Right yeah, I mean, we've been talking about our near eight-year high for a long time and talking about the other side of that hill. I don't think anybody thought the other side of the hill or the peak would be associated with global pandemic. Right. <laughs> 2020 came for us hard without a lot of warning. Um, you know, and, and one of the things you, you talked about at the beginning of that was just that that buy side, pent up demand, that makes a lot of sense to me. But I know at least what we're seeing in our market that does not yet make sense to me is that we can't get the capacity up. We can't get people to lift. So they're, they're ready to roll to the next home, but they can't get theirs out on it. And I can't determine if that's associated with just their fear of uh, being in market through this time period and in this environment, or if it's really more, um, I, I don't know. It, it just seems we're, we're still so lopsided and that's yeah. really going to be a challenge long-term. Yeah. It doesn't take long for, and it doesn't take long for the market to get lopsided, right? If you have, yeah. if you have, 30, 60, 90 days of, of uh, a significantly fewer homes going on the market than normally would be going on the market. Right. Uh, it takes a while for that to catch up. And then, to, you know, I think you alluded to it. There's also as a seller right now, it's, you know, a, a, think about the difference between a buyer and a seller right now. As a buyer, I can view properties online. I can uh, narrow it down. If I want to drive by, I can do that. If I want to go in, an agent can can arrange a, a safe showing. But as a seller, do you really want strangers coming through your home right now? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and a lot of people that are, are just not comfortable with that, understandably so. Right, and it's interesting too to think, um, you know, were, did you, were you able to put yourself in a financial position that you're able to buy before you sell, whereas that might not have been the case before? It, you know, there's just a lot of dynamics happening that are changing the way that the market rolls forward, so. I think we're going to keep a close eye. I know you guys are, and we're all going to see our way forward one way or the other. Well, Chris. Yeah, well, here's, the, here's the good news. No matter what's going on, and we've seen it through a pandemic, we've seen it through financial crisis, we've seen it through natural disasters and, and economic cycles, there's always a certain amount of people that are moving uh, right. and move regardless.
Right. Well, Chris, thank you so much. Thank you for your work at Ojo and just continuing to push the industry forward and, and embracing new technology. And thanks for having a conversation with me today. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. 